pleasure to be here, uh, to be able to participate in the celebration of, in the conference in celebration of Charlie Coleman's 65th birthday. Uh, well, oh, let me also thank the organizers for inviting me and the support. Uh, when I was starting to think of what to talk about, uh, I thought, well, I should talk about something that Charlie worked on, but it was of no help because really there are so many topics that there was no restriction really. So then I thought maybe I should talk about uh, something Charlie didn't work on, that didn't work either. And so I decided to talk about this topic, perfect plan factorizations, and I have two reasons for it. One is that very recently I wrote a survey paper, perfect plan factorizations, more or less solicited. And uh, second reason is that I think that is very that is a very nice topic, a hard topic, and uh, this uh, talk maybe something like uh, exhorting the troops to go and charge the enemy lines, uh, the enemy being whatever we don't know about perfect one factorization. So, uh, where does this topic originate? Where does it all start? Uh, what is this? Can you see that picture? It's, it's a castle. It's not Count Dracula, Dracula's castle in Transylvania. It's a castle in Smolenice, what is today Slovakia. It's about 50 kilometers east, northeast of the capital city of Bratislava. And what you are, it's a medieval castle actually, but what you are looking at is a somewhat newer incarnation of the late 19th century. The castle belonged to Graf Palfi, no relation to Peter Palfi, who is the director of Mathematical Institute in Budapest. But in 1945, this castle was nationalized. You know what it means. It was taken away from Count Palfi, like uh, many other properties. In 1953, this castle was given by the government to the Slovak Academy of Sciences. And ever since, in that castle, uh, what happens is conferences. They organize conferences, but they also take holidays there, uh, holidays for employees and members of the Academy, the Slovak Academy of Sciences. I, uh, I myself went there for several conferences and uh, I even took once in the very early 60s, uh, one week vacation with my mother there. In any case, in 1963, 55 years ago, there was a big conference, the first really big international conference on graph theory. Graph theory is a young subject and there were not really, there was a couple of conferences before, but these were really like the little workshops. This was really the first international conference with very big names. Erdős, Galai, Hayos, Harari, Izbitski, Sachs, Zico. Oh, I probably forgot some. Apart from that, probably everybody, uh, it was like who is who in graph theory at that time. Organizers were Anton Kotzik and uh, Mirek Fiedler. Uh, the name that you know well. And uh, about a year later after this conference, uh, a nice volume appeared, which is called Theory of Graphs and Its Applications. Uh, this appears, it appeared in 64, so we are talking 54 years from before, before this day. And this book, uh, which is available in many libraries, but I don't think many of you own this book. Uh, this book even today is a source of inspiration and uh, it's well worth, uh, especially for young people, 
who are getting into the subject and looking for problems to, to acquaint themselves with that book. At the end of that book is a list of problems. List of problems. And uh, on page, no, that reference is page 63 is something else. On, on page, I don't know which one, at the end, appears a problem number 20. And this is how it's stated there. Does there exist an integer n greater than 1 such that the complete 2n god is not Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian in the sense of Kotzik. Uh, in today's terminology, the question is, does a perfect one factorization of the complete graph K2n exist for all integers n greater than or equal 1? The concepts that I'm going to talk about are very simple. All of them. Well, what can be simpler than a uh, notion of a one factor perfect matching in a complete graph? Nothing, right? That can, cannot be simpler. Nothing, nothing can be simpler. Uh, one factorization of partitions. It's a partition of edges of the complete graph into these one factors. Simple. Uh, union of two factors is a union of two one factor is is a two factor which is either connected or not but again very simple thing so what's it called these the graphs which have graph not just complete are graphs which have missed a perfect one factorization oh I didn't say what a perfect one factorization is so if you have a one factorization, you look at union of two one factors, and if any such union for any two one factors is connected, is a Hamiltonian cycle, then the one factorization is perfect. Again, very simple notion. And uh, uh, what's it called graphs which do have such a perfect one factorization, strongly Hamiltonian, uh, but that's not a good terminology uh, because we understand something quite different than the Hamiltonian graph. Um, and so this newer terminology is due to Bruce Anderson from about a decade, one decade later. One decade later. So here's the problem, very simply formulated. And uh, what's it actually came to formulate this problem, he worked a lot on cubic graphs. Uh, one question he was particularly interested in was uh, which cubic graphs have a perfect one factorization in our terminology. And uh, he, know, he wasn't really terribly interested in, perfect, uh, in complete graphs, but he noticed that uh, well-known um, series of one factorizations uh, which again Bruce Anderson later called GK2N uh, or it's called sometimes the pattern start to generate with one factorization uh, is perfect if you have two n points and two n minus one is a prime and it's perfect if and only if then so uh, that's what he noticed, uh, and uh, he also noticed, although he didn't explicitly state it, but he alluded to it about in two or three papers, that when we have two m vertices and n is a prime, then also there exists a perfect one factorization. It's a different construction which uh, a different series which Bruce Anderson called GA2N. Incidentally, why is it called GK2N? Well, Eric Mendelssohn asked me many years ago, uh, why is it called GK2N? And I said, I said, God knows. And I realized what I said only when he started to laugh. God knows GK, right? <laughs> Uh, so, um, nobody knows why, why did he call this series GK and the other GA, but 
the truth is that these are the only two series on one factorization, infinite series of one factorizations known. Not quite, because very recently, Ian Wanless, Darren Bryant, and Barbara Meinhout found another infinite series of one factorizations. Unfortunately, uh, it's not a no, new infinite series of orders. It also, uh, they, they constructed one factorizations of K2n, which whenever 2n minus 1 is a prime, is also perfect and not, uh, when n is at least 12, is not isomorphic to the GK2n. So we have really just two infinite classes of orders for which we know one factorization. That's a situation that was there almost you know, some 50 years ago, or 40 maybe. Uh, uh, but then there are, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, values of n which are such that 2n minus 1 and n is not a prime, not in prime power, not a prime. So the, here are the smallest ones of them, 16, 28, 36, 40, 50, 52, and then there is another 10 orders listed below that, which are still uh, less than or equal to 100. Uh, now, there was no construction for it, but let's say, set down and somehow hammered out a, a solution for K16, and so did Bruce Anderson somewhat later. They were actually different, these two examples. And so we have K16, even though it's neither 15 nor 8 is a prime. And, oops, what did I do? that was already 70s, 73 or something. Uh, he constructed a perfect one factorization of K28. And then we have this next order, 36, 40, 50, 52. Each of these four orders merited an extra paper. It was not in this order. The order was actually 50, 36, 40, 52. Uh, I have to say that about 25 years ago, Eric Sia wrote a survey of on perfect one factorizations, and there has been very little progress uh, since then. Uh, one such example of progress is the perfect one factorization of K52, which was found by Adam Wolf, and the corresponding paper appears in JCD. So, N56 is currently the first open order. Uh, if you look at those 10 uh, numbers in the fourth row, 56 is the smallest of them, but for none of these 10 orders is a perfect one factorization currently known. And that's an unacceptable situation. Something has to be done about this. So that's one reason that I'm talking about it, that I would like this uh, to be known, and there are some bright young people who may have some new ideas. How were these examples that were found, how were they found? Well, there is uh, a method uh, of starters. Uh, let me say, tell you what is a starter in cyclic group. So if you're a cyclic group of order, then uh, all the, you partition all the non-zero elements into pairs in such a way that the differences within the pair, if you take the union of all those differences, it also gives you all the group, uh, all the group elements. And uh, the definition for uh, abelian groups, not just cyclic groups, is similar. Okay, and this is how most, there's also another very similar method 
there is a similar concept of even starters, which I won't bother to define, or, uh, which also is successful in this way. So some of the examples uh, that I mentioned were found by uh, con direct construction via uh, via uh, starters in cyclic group. Uh, I'll mention a little bit more about it later. Uh, now, why is it so difficult to find perfect one factorizations? So let's look. Here is one part of the answer. This table shows what is known about the number of non-isomorphic one factorizations up to order 16. So that's the first row here. That's the first row, um, which I denoted here, O f of n. So the, the number increases first slightly from 1 to 6, then on 10 points you have 396 non-isomorphic one factorization, but on order 12 you already have 50, 50, uh, 526 million non-isomorphic one factorization. On order 14, there's some big number which I don't know how to pronounce, and on 16, we don't have the exact number, but we have an estimate that there are approximately 7 times 10 to the 30 uh, non-isomorphic one factorizations. Uh, too much for anybody's taste. There are too many for anybody's taste. At the same time, perfect one factorizations. Uh, well, we can see that uh, by comparison, there are very few. Uh, on 10 points, only one of the 396 perfect one factorizations is, is um, perfect. Uh, we have 5 on order 12, 23 on order 14. On order 16, we know that there are exactly 88 non-isomorphic perfect one factorizations with non-trivial automorphism group. Uh, very recently, Mariusz Meshka, who is present here, yes, there it is. Uh, he did some computa computation. He set out to generate all of them and has found close to 1,500 uh, automorphism-free perfect one factorization of order 16, but he says that uh, to complete the process is not is at present computationally infeasible, although he believes that this number is probably close to the uh, total number, to real total number. So we see that mm. we have here the proverbial needle in a haystack. The haystack gets bigger, the needle gets smaller. It's hard to find these things. Uh, um, maybe this is the point where I can mention something about the isomorphism problem for one factorization and for perfect one factorization. I know Charlie said yesterday that he hates the isomorphism problem passionately because he worked on it so much. But actually he's the one who, who contributed to this. Uh, if you have uh, just one factorization, then uh, in the general population of one factorization, uh, an invariant such as cycle structure works, works very well. Uh, cycle structure means you take your set of all one factors and compare, uh, you take pairwise union of all these one factors and you get a vector of uh, n choose, n minus one choose two numbers. And that's an invariant. And it distinguishes uh, one factorizations pre pretty well. And there are other even more efficient uh, invariants such as uh, train or a triangular invariant. But in general, the theoretical uh, computational complexity of the isomorphism problem for one factorizations is currently unknown. The best known algorithm is uh, sub-exponential. It's basically the quasi-group algorithm which you have there. And 
for perfect one factorization, for instance, the cycle invariant is useless because uh, all perfect one factorizations, union of any two one factors is, is Hamiltonian cycle, so in this respect, all of them are the same. But curiously, but only for a couple of seconds, if you think about it, curiously, the isomorphism problem for perfect one factorization is polynomial. Uh, this has not been kind of explicitly stated anywhere. Uh, let me take this back. There is a, there is, it's exactly where two words were used in the paper which uh, with Mario, Mario Meshka. So we stated that. Uh, if you think about it, you, you very quickly discover that uh, that problem is polynomial because you just fix one pair of one factors and that's how we show you inside from the mappings. And not too many mappings that you can uh, have to test. Uh, and one can say actually the more that it's enough that you have just one such pair. If, you, if it's known that the one factorizations have only one such pair, it's also polynomial. And if it's number of cycles is bounded by some small number still. OK, but that was just a side. Uh, that's not the main problem that we are looking at. Uh, so that was one reason why it's so difficult to find these perfect one factorizations. Uh, we are looking for something with a very large population, uh, and there are very few of the objects that we look for. We have another good explanation. Now we know that if we are looking for designs, then uh, the elite designs are those which have large symmetries, large automorphism groups. So in triple systems, for instance, we look for uh, two transitive, doubly transitive uh, systems and they've been characterized and uh, then you lower a little bit, so you look for two homogeneous systems that get enlarges the set uh, and then you come to something where you still a lot of symmetry but the classification problem becomes hopeless. So in triple systems, for instance, if you want to classify just transitive triple systems, not so easy. Um, same thing, uh, same thing here, you think? Well, not quite, because Ed Eirig had a, has a series of papers where he investigates the group of perfect one factorizations. And basically he proves that the best you can hope is that you create a starter induced perfect one factorization, which means that there is then a group of order 2n minus 1 there, that that's basically the best or the largest group order that you can hope for, except it can be slightly bigger if there is a, some a specific subgroup, subgroup uh, by which you can enlarge this group. So that's, for instance, how, that's, for instance, how, uh, this perfect one, for, perfect one factorization of K50 was found by Eirik, Sia, and Doug Stinson, uh, probably some 25 or 30 years ago already, right? And <coughs> they, they were searching for starters in the cyclic group of order 49, but um, they restricted the search uh, by assuming also that the group is uh, extended, so to say, semi-direct product of Z49 and Z3, and that is taking the third. Um, so we cannot have too big, a, too large a group. Uh, in, uh, that would probably, in analogy with triple systems, mean that we are allowed to look for some properties of only transitive triple systems, but not larger systems. And another reason, probably the third and most, uh, most important reason, uh, the most substantial reason, uh, that we cannot make terribly big progress 
uh, is that all we have is direct constructions. Now there is a large, uh, series, a large set of orders, but all fairly large, over 100 and mostly 1,000, 20,000, etc., which were found uh, by exploiting the uh, algebraic structure of finite fields. And apart from these small examples that I mentioned, all such examples, all such orders for which a perfect one factorization was found are of the form prime power plus one. Okay. No recursive methods are currently known. Uh, we don't have a prayer to solve the problem, the Kotzik's problem, or solve the Kotzik's conjecture, or whatever you call it, if we will uh, not be able to do some recursive constructions. So uh, you can attempt, I, I believe that there is a good chance for some recursive construction, um, but using again starter generated one factorization uh, with started in sequel groups. But uh, there, is some there are some difficulties so far, so I won't say any more about it. Oh, I can say that uh, the 55 years old conjecture by Fossey uh, is, it will take some time to solve it. But please don't despair. Uh, let me say a few words. Uh, this perfect one factorizations can be considered for complete bipartite graph, bipartite graphs, for regular graphs, for various degrees. I want to talk about it apart from cubic graphs. I want to say a few words about cubic graphs. Okay, I'm fine. Um, so, this is how Kotzig actually came to considering perfect one factorizations of complete graphs, which somehow uh, have overtaken in, in importance the cubic graph. But there are very nice problems in cubic graphs too. So uh, we consider only cubic graphs of class one. If you have class two, then there is no one factorization whatsoever. So class one, we have a one factorization, but we may have cubic graphs which do not have a perfect one factorization, then we can have cubic graphs which have only perfect one factorizations, and then we have the mixed case where we have both, uh, I shouldn't say non-perfect, I should probably say imperfect, but I'm not, I don't know. Uh, so there are some necessary conditions. If you want a cubic graph which has a perfect one factorization, then it cannot contain K4 minus E is a subgraph, not induced subgraph, it's a subgraph. Or if it cannot, for instance, contain these two subgraphs, then it won't have it. On the other hand, if you look at these three categories again, uh, do we have examples in all categories? Sure. Uh, uh, this is a simple example where you have a cubic graph which admits only perfect one factorization, in fact, unique. And here you have a cubic graph which admits a perfect one factorization and also non-perfect one factorization. And if you think of a prism, then that's an example of a cubic graph, the cubic graph that has a one factorization but doesn't have a perfect one factorization. So we have all these uh, uh, the, all these classes are non-empty, starting with some point, eight, 10 or 12 points. Now, Kotzik proved the theorem that the bipartite cubic graph with two inverse vertices can have a perfect one factorization only if n is odd. So the number of vertices has to be two modulo four. If it's four, uh, zero modulo four, it cannot have a perfect one factorization. And that's how you get, for instance, the prism uh, uh, with, but also the prism with 4k vertices does not have a one factorization as a corollary to this theorem, but also prism with 4k plus 2 vertices cannot have one factorization. Now here is some statistics about 
these uh, about cubic graphs up to 16 points. So, uh, okay, here is listed class two also because uh, the cubic, what you see in the last row is the total number of cubic graphs with two and vertices. And that uh, can be calculated because there is a closed formula for number of cubic graphs. But it's not clear how to calculate the number of cubic graphs in each of these categories. Uh, it appears from this data, which is uh, admittedly uh, goes up to 16 points, and maybe one should not draw too strong a conclusions, too strong conclusions from this. But it appears that uh, those cubic graphs which do not admit a perfect one factorization are more numerous than the ones which admit it or the ones which have both. Uh, well, the nice open problems. For instance, there have been there has been a characterization of uh, circulant cubic graphs from the point of view of admitting or not admitting uh, perfect one factorization. I want to uh, say a few words about one nice prominent class of cubic graphs, and these are generalized Peterson graphs. Now, what are generalized Peterson graphs? Well, you can picture it quite easily. A generalized Peterson graph with parameters n and k has two n vertices. Uh, think of a outer rim which uh, has a uh, n vertices, cycle of n, circle of n vertices, and any two vertices adjacent on this circle are joined by an edge. So, so to say, the vertices at distance one on this cycle are joined by an edge. Then there is an inner, inner cycle of vertices, but there the vertices are joined if they are at the distance k. So, uh, for instance, gp, n1, these are the prisms, okay? And then there is also spokes which join uh, corresponding vertices on outer circle, outer cycle, outer circle, with the one with the inner circle. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the original Peterson graph is generalized Peterson graph with parameters 5, 2. We, of course, now a pentagon uh, on the outside, pentagram on the inside, and the spokes that Peterson graph. So, generalized Peterson graphs are defined in this way. And uh, then we have a result by Simona von Vicini, which is right here, and Mazzuopolo. They looked at uh, generalized Peterson graphs, and they have some nice results. They established that uh, generalized Peterson graphs and two have a perfect one factorization if and only if n is three or four modulo six. Uh, when we have n three, then we have just one example possible. When then they have a necessary condition that if n is uh, even and k is odd, we do not, we cannot have a perfect one factorization. Okay, so that's one, two, three. What about four and bigger? When for k greater than or equal four, it's an open problem. We looked a little bit at this with Marius. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, we usually assume that uh, k doesn't exceed, uh, is strictly less than n over two. Uh, so, G, uh, here, GP, Gerard Peterson graph 9, 4, that's the smallest one with k equal 4 that we consider. And that's the well-known touch example of a uniquely triage colorable cubic graph. Uh, it's a, a, usually that graph is uh, represented as GP9-2, but they are isomorphic. And so that's category P, fine, but then we go on. And here is the uh, interesting stuff. When n is odd between 9 and 65, 
then we have a perfect one factorization for every such n except it doesn't exist when n is 11, 13, 17, and 35. We don't know what happens for n greater than 65 and odd, and we have no clue as to why there doesn't exist a perfect one factorization of GP 35, 4. Uh, similarly, when we have n even, and between 10 and 64, then uh, there are more non uh, cases when there is a non-existence, when we have non-existence. So we've got, for the small values up to 26, there is no perfect one factorization. Then there is one for 28 and 30, and again, there is none for 32 up to 44, and then again, there is one up to 64. Um, it's difficult to formulate on this, uh, these circumstances, to formulate the conjecture what happens. Uh, when, and, uh, when k is 5, it's not much better. Now, the theorem that I mentioned by Bonvicini and Mazzocolo, can't you have shorter names? <laughs> anyway, uh, I, yeah, by the, by the theorem, we cannot have uh, perfect one factorization when it's even. So this leaves us with n odd. And again, what happens here is the following. Between n, uh, for n between 11 and 51, then, uh, we have a perfect one factorization except for these orders, 11, 13, 29, 41. Uh, and as, uh, on top of it, uh, generalized Peterson graph 15, 5 admits only perfect one factorizations, more than one, but only perfect. So as I mentioned, it's difficult to formulate an existence conjecture, just it's a nice problem. Uh, concept, a long time ago, there was, uh, you know, when he worked, the com theoretical computational complexity theory was in the future. So he asked for characterization of cubic graphs, uh, which admit or do not admit uh, perfect one factorization. And he did a lot of work. Uh, it's worthwhile to study his papers from early 60s. It, you get interested in the problem. Uh, but, but uh, as I said, he asked for a characterization, and uh, it wasn't at that time very clear what is meant by characterization. I mean, you, you can have all kinds of characterization which, uh, which uh, do not tell you too much. But uh, the truth is that very many problems remain even when you consider factorizations of cubic graphs. Now in in uh, exactly six days my good friend Kurt Linna will celebrate his empty atheist birthday. And so allow me to borrow a phrase from his book, uh, he says, I believe I can win your friendship by finishing it on time and even a little bit earlier. So thank you very much. of the complete graph with an odd number of points. 
So anyway, think of a number such as 36. You drop a point, you have 35. And that's an odd number. And if you duplicate it, you get uh, something that is 2 modulo 4, which is 4 and four and minus 2. From 36, you go to 70, which is 4 and minus 2. Yes. Uh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, uh, of course, uh, what you said is, makes sense, but in practical terms, there's a added difficulty if you start with something which is something like that. Does anyone have a less-like question? Yeah. Yeah. There are never naive questions. <laughs> Is there any, uh, recursive construction for the uniform one factorization? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is there any recursive construction for the uniform one factorization? For the uniform? Mm, yeah, uniform one factorizations are the next best thing up, the perfect one factorization. Uh, uh, I, I can't think of it right now. I don't know. Uh, maybe there are. I can't think. But of course, there are many more more results on uniform one factorization because you can get them from designs, from two, from even from homogeneous, two homogeneous designs. And, yeah. Well, there are no further questions. Then um, the next talk will start at nine twenty. Thank you, Alex.